G'day there. You're watching the Aussie BIM Guru, and today we're back to feasibility. Um, I did have a series previously, and I'm just adding an additional part to it. So we're looking today at face analysis grids in Dynamo. Um, so essentially, we've looked at how to build a feasibility study in Revit and Dynamo and Power BI in a previous series. Um, feel free to watch that if you haven't already. It's on my channel in a playlist. Um, but today we're going to look at how to convert our results from a sun study into a face analysis study instead. So essentially, we're taking some results from sensors within our study, and then we're going to be, we've already done this part, so we've sent sun rays to our sensors to count how many hours they're receiving, um, using vectors and times of day and the ladybug package. And we've ended up with a bunch of results on our facade, but obviously this doesn't look very nice. Um, it's all just orbs with color based on a filter, so it's not really suitable for a report, uh, for example. So what we're gonna do in this study is convert this into a face. Um, so we're not going to use any custom nodes today, but we are going to be using Dynamo. So you will need Dynamo. Um, you're also going to need some results on a surface. So these can be like a family, like the way I've set mine up. It can be a lot of different elements that can hold data, which you can tell Dynamo to push back onto a surface. So I'm going to show you how to do that today. And the surface will need to be on a mass. Face analysis doesn't work on anything except for massing from my experience. There might be other categories in Revit that can handle these studies, but I haven't found them yet. So for versioning, I recommend that we use Dynamo 2.x at the very least, but ideally 2.0.3 is a good version. Um, I know that Ladybug doesn't work in 2.1 at the moment, so probably 2.0.3 in 2019 should work. Without further ado, let's get started and jump straight into our model. So I'm essentially picking up where I was uh, during part 9 of my series. <clears throat> so I have a model here with a bunch of faces with results upon them. And you'll rem you might remember these are adaptive components placed at a point. So, sorry, I've got a cat going across my computer there. Whoops. <laughs> so essentially it's a an adaptive component placed at a point. And within this adaptive component, there's a bit of information stored. So one of these things is the number of sun hours that the sensor received in this parameter here. And also the comment one and a comment two are basically telling you which study it's a part of and which side of the building it is. So you can see here, this is the north side of my building, for example, because you can only do one face at once using face analysis. So we're going to isolate these sensors based on those parameters in our script. Anyway, well, let's jump into Dynamo. So I've just got a fresh script here and I'm in manual mode at the moment. So the first thing we're going to do is get the family types and we're going to find our detector family or whichever family holds the data that you want to convert to a surface. So mine is my se my sensor in this case called detector. But then I'm going to get all the family instances by family type. So it's this node here, the fifth one down. Um, if you feed this in, this will give you every instance of that in your entire project. Um, so if I run this, I should get a list of about 1500 sensors. Obviously, we, I don't want to use all of these sensors. So I'm going to start getting some data about these elements to filter it down. So I'm going to get parameter value by name. And I'm going to run this twice in order to filter down my sets firstly based on the option that they're related to, and then the face that they're related to. So I'm going to get a string as well. And I'm just going to go for my comment field. And if you were building this for Dynamo Player, you'd make this an input. Um, I won't build for Dynamo Player today, but this is the first input you'd use. You'd basically set your two parameters as an input, and then the two values that you're filtering for as inputs as well. And then the other input would be the type of family for the sensor and the face you're analyzing. Um, but I'm going to pass through those today just to save a bit of time. Okay, so what we need to check is, does this parameter equal a certain value? And the value that I'm looking for in this case is option 1b. But this could be any value in your study. Maybe you don't need to filter your data twice. Maybe you only need to filter it once. Maybe you don't need to filter it at all. Maybe you're looking at all the elements. But essentially, these should be the things against the surface that you're analyzing. So we're going to use a Boolean mask in order to filter our data down. So we're going to take those family instances, and based on their value, we're going to filter them down. So essentially, everything that goes out of our in-list now belongs to study 1b. Uh, I think at the moment I've only done one study, so we should expect that all of them are going to be in there. But if you're future-proofing your script um, and you're basing your feasibility study on the method I showed you, this is the way to do it. So what we're going to do now is just take another set of that, essentially, and filter it down one more time. So we're going to take our in-list. I'm going to filter by comment 2 in this case, and I'm going to filter for uh, North Tower in this case. So now we're just getting our North Face. 
So now I will actually get some level of filtering on my sensors as a result. So we'll take our in list and we'll mask based on that. So now I should only get the sensors on my north face. So you can see now we are actually are getting rid of quite a lot of sensors in our study. Um, about 1,200 of them are being excluded from our study. So that's great. Okay, because we're going to be applying this to a face. So it can take a little bit of time if you have too many things. Okay, so what we're going to do is just build a little naming algorithm based on these two things that we've picked. Um, so we're just going to say that our naming algorithm is uh, x plus semicolon space apostrophe plus y because we're going to build a name for our surface analysis study. So let's just make it our option and then our... So we're going to get option 1b semicolon north tower. And you'll see why I do this in a second. Okay, so what we want to do then is get the location of all of our sensors. So if you look for element location and just go down to get location for get existing elements location, we're going to get the location of all our sensors. So I'll just do a fit and there you go. That, that's my sensors in, in Dynamo. Um, and then we're going to have to get our face. So we're going to do a get face node or select face. And I'm just going to temporarily minimize this window so I can go into, into Revit and get my face. So I'm going to pick this face here. So this is my study face and this is where my analysis group will be applied to. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to find the closest point to that face. So we're going to use closest point two. So from that face to each of these points. And we're going to lace it to longest so that every single point finds out the closest point and essentially we, we should get a set of points on that face because um, these sensors are actually pushed away from the face just a tiny bit so i need to go back to my surface and find a point exactly on that surface so it understands the parameter to be applied on the study at that point on the surface okay uh, from there we need to actually go and we need to map some uv coordinates so i'm going to show you why now so we're going to use a node to create our face analysis study so we're going to look for face analysis display. So there's a few sets of nodes that relate to face analysis study. In this case, we're going to use by face points and values. So our face points are essentially these points that we've mapped onto our face. And our surface is the surface here. So we're going to get, um, firstly, we're going to get our view. I'm just going to freeze this node for now because we don't want to run this yet. So we're going to get current document. Um, I'm just going to search for it because I have quite a lot of custom packages with current nodes. So current document and active view. It's always good to make sure that you're using the native active view node where possible. Um, obviously that means there's less custom packages required to run your script for quite a common node. Um, some packages do require you to use their version of the current document because they convert their their language into something native to their package, such as uh, Orchid, for example. Anyway, um, I digress. So we're now going to go and feed in our surface as our test surface. Um, you can see that now we need sample locations. So we have our samples. So our samples should be, sorry, our sample locations are going to be a little bit tricky. So we need to find the UV parameter at those points. Because if you check sample locations, it's basically saying the locations at which you want to create the analysis values, but it's not receiving them as points. It's receiving them as UV mapped points instead. So what we need to do is we need to run a list map um, upon our points. So we're going to find out the UV parameter at point on our test surface. So UV parameter at point. So for every single point on our surface, we want to find out its UV. So our surface is our input, but we need to list map this because we want to do every single point. So we're going to use a list map and we're going to be running in each point at a UV to this face. And then we're going to run this and we should get a UV for every single point as a result. There we go. And then we just want to flatten this list. And it's important that you keep the list structure in the same order throughout the script because we're going to go back and pull our values from our sensors as well. Okay, so that's our sample locations, but now we need our samples. 
So this section is quite easy. So what we need to do is get our parameter. So in this case, this is my sun hours. So I'm just going to get another get parameter value by name. And I'm going to go to my sensors after I filtered them. And I'm going to search for the sun parameter value, which in my case was abg underscore data underscore sunlight, uh, sun hours one. So essentially we should get a list of values now that I can feed through as my sample values, which will guide my surface analysis grid. Okay, so that's my samples. And then all we need is a name, a description, and a unit type. So for name and description, I'm just gonna use my name, naming algorithm that I built earlier. And for unit type, in this case, I don't have any specific units that I've used, it's just a number. So what you can do in this case is actually just input the value in null but you could use a unit of measurement if you knew you were using a specific unit like meters, for example, um, or volume. So it just comes down to your study, obviously. Okay, so at this point, we're actually good to run the study. So I'm just gonna unfreeze and we're ready to go. So we've got our face nominated. We've got all our sensors ready. Uh, what I might do is just close and reopen to refresh all my nodes and I'll run the study. So if I go run, it should apply all of this data into a surface analysis. And hopefully you should see something like this. Revit analysis display, face analysis display is basically the node's way of telling you it worked. And if we go into Revit, straight away you can see that I've got some results coming up. And that's because I set my default analysis study sample to just a new surface analysis display. So I probably need to explain surface analysis settings first. I'm just gonna hide all my sensors. So this is sort of what a surface analysis display looks like. Um, you can see all my dynamo points are on at the moment, so I might just go turn those off uh, because they're sort of getting in the way. So we need to turn off closest point two and I'll turn off my face as well. Okay, so you can see that we've got a gradient um, which is ranging between a certain color range. So you can see over here, we have a little legend that's popped up as well. Um, but the way that this has all been triggered is through the analysis display settings in the view properties. Um, and I actually set previously a default analysis display style. Usually this would be set to none. Um, so you wouldn't see anything straight away, but you would need to come here to edit. And then you can create a surface analysis study here under analysis display style. You can see my study ranges between seven hours and zero, and there's no units applicable to the study. Um, obviously, you can turn it on and off at will, and this is a view-specific study. It won't appear in every single view in your project, just the one that you conducted it in. What we're going to do is create a new style. So the first thing we can do is just have a look at some of our basic settings. I might just zoom in so it's easy to see how these things impact the study. Um, most of you probably haven't actually seen this area of Revit before, um, so hopefully this is a new technique for most of you. It was quite new to me until recently. So one setting you can do is just add grid lines. And essentially this will show you the surface analysis division of how the study was conducted by samples. So you can see exactly how many samples were taken to generate the study. You can also change the color of the grid. You can change the transparency of your study as well. Um, I don't usually like changing the transparency because it will actually change the transparency of the face that you run the study on. So it looks a bit strange because usually you see through it. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, I haven't noticed what contour does yet, to be honest. Um, I haven't noticed it have an impact on my studies. If anyone knows, feel free to leave it in the comments, um, or it's probably on Google too, if anyone is interested. Let's just make our grid black for now, so that it's more obvious. Okay, so what's important now is to go to color, and you can either work on a gradient or a range. I'm gonna just work on a range today, because I, I prefer ranges myself. So we're gonna just add, we'll add six rows, so I'm just gonna add six rows and you'll see that now we have just six steps in our gradient. I can immediately apply this and just accept the colors. Um, what I'm gonna do is set all my values. So I know my minimum is zero. So my first value I need to specify is one, two, three, four, five, six, and my maximum is seven. So if I apply that, you'll see that I've already got a seven stage color scale. Obviously you can change these values as well. Um, you can do a gradient as well. A gradient goes between the colors, um, whereas a non-gradient typically is more separate between the samples. So if I turn off my grid lines, you'll notice the difference a bit more. So a gradient is more smooth, a range is more stark. So you can see that that's much more clear. I prefer a range because I think it's more accurate and it represents the true samples, whereas a gradient is a little bit misleading because you haven't actually tested the whole way along that gradient. 
Um, so if you're working with very few samples, it can be quite misleading. What I'll do is I'll just add an extra value for zero. Now we have full control over our samples. So for my study, I use colors a little bit like this. So I start with blue and then I work my way through greens. And eventually I make my way up to yellow. So I go through greens, I go up to an orange, pale yellow, and a bright yellow. I don't quite use those RGBs, but more or less. And you'll see that as you change those, all your samples change as well. So pretty cool, right? Um, you can also turn off the legend if you don't want to see it, and you can modify some properties about it. So you can change the text sizes present in the legend. Um, you can change the rounding of the figures, and that pretty much customizes everything. You can change the height of your color samples as well. I haven't actually tried that, but I assume it just makes everything a little bit different. So by default, it must assume a, a default, I guess, if you don't specify. So if you go zero, you see I've got a fair bit of control over that legend in terms of its proportions and its size. So pretty neat. Um, so I found this a really handy technique because what I do from here is basically I conduct multiple studies and I fix my view to a specific angle. So what I'll do is I'll just, I'll turn off my legend and get that out of the way. And um, I'll just show you what I usually do. So what I'll do now is I'll lock my view orientation. And then typically I just crop my view down to a specific size. And I pretty much just build up a couple of images to composite in Photoshop. Cool. So I've got one study there. Obviously it's not quite the same colors I used before. Um, you can obviously, I might just turn the grid on. I think it looks a bit yucky without the grid. <laughs> cool. Let's just turn that on. Looks a bit more technical. Cool. No, it looks much better. And you can pretty much just export these out as image passes and composite them in an image software such as Photoshop. So usually I just convert these to say, a, usually an increment of two. So I'll just pick 2048 wide as a PNG. Save it somewhere. Let's just call that one. I'll just start booting up Photoshop in the background. And then what you can do with Dynamo, the great thing about this is you can just go and run another study. So I can just pick a different face and a different set of sensors. So I can just go change, pick a new face, and I can say West Tower instead of North Tower. Run my study again. And there we go. Now I have all my samples in that face as well. And I can just export that. I can obviously turn off my turn off my mass as well if I just want to isolate that for Photoshop's sake. Actually I can't because it's part of the mass. Sorry, I stand corrected. Whoop. I don't want to export OBC images and you just take the other one. So let's just say in that case, I'm just going to call that two. And then in Photoshop, I can just go and grab my first pass and my second pass. And all I have to do is just a little bit of sneaky lassoing. Obviously I'm being quite rough. Um, I was advised you take a bit more care than I do. There's probably better ways to manage this with the layers and masks as well. But there you go. So you get like a full a full study across the face of your building. So that, that's a much more effective way of communicating the results of a study using face analysis. Um, so hopefully that sort of helps give you a new, a new technique in Revit and Dynamo that you probably weren't aware of. Um, and it helps you get better results for your clients and for yourself. So thanks for watching today. Um, there'll be more videos on feasibility in future. Uh, I'm not sure when the next one will be. But there are some topics I have lined up. So um, if you're interested in this series, um, there'll be more for you. So thanks for watching today, and um, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you've got any comments or feedback, feel free to leave it in the comments. Um, if you've got any future requests, I'm always happy to hear them as well. Getting a lot of collaboration from my followers, which I'm really enjoying. Um, so thanks for watching today. Um, if you're not already following and subscribing, feel free to do so. And I'll see you in the next video. Thanks. Take care. Bye.